For centuries, the tarot cards have tumbled through history, a tantalizing blend of mystery and beauty. Packed with potent images and ancient symbols, these cards have predicted the rise and fall of kings and empires. Linked to the most ancient mystical systems, the tarot card's origins are as mysterious as the source of their powers. How can a pack of cards probe the past and unlock the secrets of the future? And how do tarot readers use the extraordinary images on the cards to unravel our deepest, darkest concerns? The tarot is more than a set of beautiful cards. It's a system of divination, a way to reveal the unknown. Penetrating mystery and deception, it answers questions about the past and the present and hints at what is to come. Millions of people have discovered for themselves the uncanny power of the tarot. Among them was Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, general to the Emperor Napoleon. France, January 1804. Bernadotte arrived at the house of celebrated tarot reader Mademoiselle Lenormand. He had heard of her success in using cards to foretell the future and wanted to test their power for himself. Pretending to be a businessman, Bernadotte asked Lenormand to predict the outcome of a fictitious commercial venture. As she did with all her clients, she told him to shuffle the cards and concentrate on the question he was asking. She then focused her mind and spread out the cards. The first one she turned over was the Knight of Swords. She told Bernadotte that he was no businessman, but a high-ranking military officer. The cards had seen through his disguise. You are not only of high rank, she told him. You are connected to one who will be made emperor. The third card was the King of Swords. And you yourself will one day be a great king. The last card was death. If the cards were accurate, then Napoleon would become Emperor of France. But if Bernadotte were to become king, would he have to overthrow Napoleon? Later the same year, Napoleon indeed became Emperor of France. In 1818, three years after Napoleon's downfall, Bernadotte was crowned king, not of France, but of Sweden. The tarot continues to enlighten those who use it. In the hands of a skilled reader like Patty McLean, the tarot can illuminate every facet of life. The tarot is a wonderful philosophical system that can get into all the nuances of your positive and negative energies in terms of how you're conducting your life and it can show you what you're doing wrong and where you need to give some thought to making correction in your pattern. Life is often likened to a journey in which obstacles are faced and options chosen. The images of the tarot deck reflect the stages and the challenges of this journey. To the uninitiated, the tarot cards are just pictures. To the trained reader, they are a language. The reader is the translator, the intermediary who tells the querents, as those seeking the reading are called, what their cards mean. Tarot reading is a very personal business. There's no such thing as a right and wrong way to read the cards, and readers vary widely in both style and method. But the principle of a tarot reading is always the same. The reader, or sometimes the querent, shuffles the cards, and the reader lays them out according to one of a number of set patterns known as spreads. Then the reader interprets the cards and addresses the querent's particular concerns. People seek a reading in order to focus for a while on their life 
to reflect on their personal situation. They want to know, am I on the right track? Am I making the right decisions? Or other times, it's very much about why am I making the wrong decisions? And the good readings, when people come in and they have got a lot of mess, and they are making the wrong decisions, but what's good about those readings is that they're prepared to try and work out, to take that responsibility. What am I doing wrong? Is this a pattern? Am I working through something? You know, how can I best alter my approach to make the best out of what's happening around me? Whatever the querent's motive, there's no point in trying to conceal it. To a skilled reader, the cards reveal everything. I do a very basic Celtic cross, so for me I put two cards down in a cross shape. Now, for me, nine times out of ten, with those two cards, I have got exactly the situation why they've come for a reading. Most readers agree that the cards are like a code, and the reader the code breaker. The pictures on the cards are ancient mystical symbols. Parapsychologist Susan Blackmore believes that they trigger responses on both conscious and unconscious levels. All these things speak of, of experiences in people's lives. And so it's not surprising that when you look at these pictures, they inspire emotions, uh, recognition, nostalgia. All, all of these things come pouring up in response to the cards, just because they are common, human, basic experiences. Tarot readers are trained to identify every level of meaning in the images. Learning to read tarot requires dedication and practice. Bob Place finds that the best readers combine knowledge of the cards with intuition. To read tarot cards is a talent, but you can learn. I believe that a, all a talent is is an aptitude. So some people have more aptitude than others, just like for art. Anyone can learn to draw, but not everyone is going to draw like Leonardo da Vinci. You must learn about the symbols and the wisdom tradition behind the symbols and what the symbols mean. But then you must make the, the uh, leap of faith. You must make the intuitive decision. And, and that intuition, which is just basically looking at the pictures and telling a story. Learning all the imagery of the tarot would be quite a challenge. Each deck is different and the meanings assigned by the deck's creators can vary considerably. There's no such thing as one definitive tarot deck. There are literally hundreds to choose from. It doesn't matter which deck is used. As long as the reader thoroughly understands the deck's symbols, the outcome should be the same. Most readers settle with one or two personal favorites. With constant use, the deck's images become so internalized that the readers are hardly aware of the code-breaking process. The basic structure of all tarot decks is the same. There are 78 cards made up of two parts, or arcana, from the Latin word for secret. The major arcana and the minor arcana. The 56 minor arcana cards are the forerunners of our modern playing cards and like them are divided into four suits. The major arcana looks quite different. They are all picture cards full of complex images. They represent archetypes, the universal symbols which psychologists believe are present in the collective subconscious. Tarot readers see the cards as typifying the challenges we all meet in real life. Only the Fool card stands apart. Unlike the other major arcana cards, he doesn't have a number. He's not a fool in a modern sense, rather an open-minded innocent eager to learn. In the tarot, he represents us, the human traveler through life. The fall I see is like the, the original, it's the zero card, it's no beginning, no end. And it's just that spontaneous burst of energy, which has no moral, no anything, it's neither good nor bad, it just is. Many tarot readers are helped to understand the tarot by seeing it as the story of the fool's journey through the major arcana. The remaining cards are numbered 1 to 21, and they can be seen in order as staging posts through which the fool passes on his allegorical journey from birth to enlightenment. The cards would never fall in this order during a reading. Indeed, the fool card is no more likely to appear in a reading than any other. 
but following the fool on this metaphorical journey makes the meanings and associations of each card become clear. As the fool begins his quest, he meets the first card, numbered one, the magician. The magician is the intellect, it's the, the academic side, the knowledge, the brain, the power, the mind, and that the magician is always shown pointing to heaven and pointing to earth. The idea is you act as a lightning conductor for energy. The magician is a creator. He symbolizes the fool's birth, his spark into life, his vital energies. From him, the fool learns to create new opportunities and ideas. When the magician card appears in a reading, it means that the querent must be ingenious and creative in dealing with his problems. Sometimes, a card is dealt upside down. This reversal alters its meaning, usually to an extreme form of the card's face qualities. If the magician, for example, is dealt reversed, it suggests cunning, trickery, or outright deception. Almost as important as the face meaning of the card is the place where it appears in the spread, its position. In the most simple spreads, the position determines what point in time the card refers to. When you do a three-card spread, um, you get the client to shuffle the cards, and then you slap them into three piles. And I take it that the, the left-hand pile represents the past, the middle pile is the present situation, and the, the third, obviously, how it's progressing into the future. Um, if you need more clarification on the spread, you literally just take from the relevant pile with each card to sort of elucidate what past influence is. Um, and again, it, they're usually very immediate readings. For some readers, the position of a card in the larger spreads also determines which aspect of the querent's life the card is describing. There's a money position, there's a romance position, there's father and mother and marriage and, and there's uh, travel and there's, you know, your career. So there's all these positions and as the cards come up, you define, you limit them to their position and that gives you a, a much more precise reading in my opinion. Watching tarot readers interpreting their cards, it's easy to imagine this ancient art being handed down from the earliest civilizations. But the history of the tarot is blurred and unclear. It's almost as mysterious as the images themselves. The mystical symbols so common on the tarot cards suggest a connection to the ancient civilizations of the East. 19th century admirers of the tarot assumed that the cards had originated there and filtered into Europe with the first trade and travel contacts between East and West. Another popular theory was that they were brought back by crusaders fighting the Saracens in the Holy Land. Much of the mathematics, astrology and alchemy then flourishing in the East did indeed travel this route. But the tarot cards didn't appear in Europe until two centuries after the last crusaders had returned. How then did the tarot arrive in the West? Professor Michael Dummett, an expert on the history of cards, is convinced that they did not come from the East at all. It's quite certain that tarot cards originated in northern Italy in the early 15th century. Um, the earliest actual documentary reference to them is from 1442, from the account books of the court of Ferrara. But I think they were probably invented about two decades earlier, sometime in the 1420s. But these cards weren't used to reveal the future. The tarot then was a mere card game. The oldest tarot cards still in existence were painted by an unknown artist for the Italian Visconti family around 1450, when playing the tarot game was a fad of the wealthy. Nobles competed to commission the finest hand-painted decks the Visconti family even included a portrait of a relative in their deck. Sister Manfreda was a model for their version of the High Priestess, the second card of the Major Arcana and the next stage of the Fool's Journey. The High Priestess 
is the fool's spiritual mother. Her book represents all the knowledge which the fool must acquire on his journey. When the High Priestess card appears in a reading, it may represent the Querent's secret lover or an unknown admirer. The parlor game of the Renaissance aristocrats was just the beginning of the tarot story. Gradually, the appeal of the game widened. The cards were simplified, copied, and eventually printed. One of the first decks to become popular was the Marseille, which is still considered a classic. It isn't clear at what point the tarot deck went from popular card game to a system of divination, but the step from playing cards to fortune-telling is a small one. How often in a game of chance do players think that fate has dealt them a bad hand? Chance can rapidly become destiny. At some point in the three centuries after their birth, that leap was made with the tarot, and it became more than a pack of playing cards. Gradually, each card acquired a meaning, which for the minor arcana cards closely mirrors the structure of medieval society. The wands, representing the peasants, have taken on the meaning of work and enterprise. The coins, representing the merchants, are now associated with business and finance. The cups, representing the church, now relate to all spiritual matters, including affairs of the heart. And the swords, representing the military class, have taken on the meaning of conflict, tensions, and difficulties. Each card within the suit has also acquired a special meaning. For instance, the Nine of Swords implies paranoia and conflict, while the Seven of Swords represents a severing, either emotional, like a divorce, or physical, like a broken leg. One woman, I got sword cards in her past, the Knight of Swords, um, Five of Swords, all this conflict, fighting and tension, and it was coming up with the Ten of Cups in a family. And I, I just went into it, saying, oh my God, you poor girl, what you've been through, the stress, the battles, everything, and it was like warfare. And she said, yes, yes, I'm from Bosnia. <laughs> the gypsies, nomadic people who moved across Europe and parts of Asia, are sometimes credited with first realizing the fortune-telling possibilities of the tarot. They were known to be card players and gamblers, but they were also experts in mysticism and magic. In previous centuries, it was the gypsies to whom Europeans turned to have their future told, with questions about health, happiness, marriage, and love. In just this way, many people now turn to tarot readers, and their questions are still the same. Quite often someone will come to me, and often a question that a young woman will have is, should I marry George or Tom or Dick or Harry? and I will proceed to shuffle the cards as she concentrates on her question. And uh, when she has it firm in her mind, we will cut the cards, and then she will put the cards back in the order that she wants them in. Then we will read. The first card covers the question. She has the chariot here, which is like a protective influence of family all around her. Uh, we are crossing the question with the Eight of Pentacles, which can be an opposing force or it can be a helpful force. But this shows an educational or working experience. So maybe she met George at work. Then this shows that it was a very exciting, promising event because we have the Wheel of Fortune at the bottom. Um, it's possible that George has been married in the past. We have a Seven of Cups here. And she's been wishing and hoping to meet someone for quite a while, too. And up above, we have the lovers, which seems very appropriate that she's looking for love and they'd like to marry. And she's asking, is he the right one? It's looking really promising because we have the two of cups in the future, which is reciprocal love. It's all looking very favorable at the moment. We have the sun down here in her house of fears, which is a light coming out and dispelling all the fears that she might have. We have the star of destiny. I mean, this is a destined situation. And here we have the King of Wands. Now, it could be that George has a very fiery nature. And the final answer, oops, we have another man showing up. So, as the lovers can indicate a choice between two, and she may have only met the first man, so that she'll end up having to choose. But it's all a part of her destiny. For the fool on his journey, 
Destiny has not begun to take a hand. He has only just started to learn about himself as he moves through the major arcana. The Emperor and Empress are the next two cards he meets. They represent the security and guidance of parents. When the Empress card appears in a reading, it suggests a happy and mature relationship, sometimes even pregnancy. When the Emperor appears, it shows the need for wisdom and leadership, law and order. Divination from any deck of cards depends on one central belief, that the fall of the cards can be more than a random event. There are so many possible combinations of the tarot cards that the chances of them falling the same way twice are minute, one in many millions. And tarot readers believe that the cards that turn up are no accident. I've been asked this question by quite a, quite a few of my clients at the end of their reading. If we picked these up and started over, what would we get, you know? But I find in my experiences of teaching, and uh, when you do just a 10 card spread, which you could do, two or three times, uh, that I've had the same card come as, up as an answer two out of three times. Or I've had the same cards come up in a spread in, a different, in slightly different positions, or cards with, slightly, with very similar meanings come up. Tarot readers agree that the shuffle of the cards upon which the deal depends is the most important point in the process. Many readers are certain that the hands of the shuffler are influenced by subconscious energies, but they disagree about who should shuffle the cards. Bob Place always shuffles himself. When I am shuffling, the small motor muscles you know, in my hands are controlling where the cards are going, and I'm unconsciously ordering the cards. When I'm done shuffling the cards, my hands stop. They don't want to shuffle anymore. Obviously I could force them to shuffle, but I don't need to force them. I know it's time and I stop and then I let the person make the final cut and the cards come out and it works. Other readers insist that the querent takes part in the shuffling process. The main reason I think that you do get the client to mix the cards is that so they do have some personal interaction in what comes up because I always remember one client in particular who had, who came to see me and who was expecting a clairvoyant. And she was quite shocked at the thought that she had to shuffle cards. And she was quite insistent. She didn't want to mix them. She wanted no responsibility. She just wanted to be told what was going to happen. She felt she didn't want to influence anything. And it was then I thought, mix the cards. And it was quite an experience for her because she found that there was nothing to be scared of. So I make them mix the cards thoroughly, put them into four, five or six piles. Then I make them take the top card of each pile, turn it around, and then I get them to mix them back again. And the whole process means that they are thoroughly mixed into those cards, <laughs> and they can't deny it. The shuffle is considered so important that readers sometimes prepare for it by building concentration through rituals, such as unwrapping the cards, playing music, or lighting candles. When I begin to shuffle the cards, I'm a voluntary clairvoyant, and when I begin to shuffle the tarot cards, that's the signal to my unconscious to get ready to be psychic, to, be, to, to open up, to go in a slightly altered place, which is like a meditative state. The ritual of the tarot is echoed in the next card of the fool's journey, the Hierophant, also known as the Pope. He represents the fool's spiritual father. From him, the fool learns humility and compassion. When the Pope card appears in a reading, it can signify someone who is greatly respected by the querent. Real-life Popes have taken an unfavorable view of the tarot. The 15th and 16th century church suppressed any suggestion of a power not ratified by Christianity. Declared dangerous and heretical, tarot cards were banned and systematically burnt wherever they were found. The tarot went underground. It was to remain hidden for some 200 years until a chance meeting propelled it once more out of obscurity. In the late 1770s, a French clergyman called Antoine Cour de Gébelin came upon some travelers playing cards. He was intrigued and delighted by their deck. He had never seen such strange and fascinating images on a pack of cards. The travelers told him that they believed their cards to have come from Egypt. This struck an immediate chord with Echevelin, 
was already interested in new evidence that the ancient Egyptians had been masters of magic and ritual. Antoine Cote de Geblin, 1781, he published eight volumes dealing with esoteric material, including uh, a chapter called Le Jeu du Tarot in Le Monde Primitif. And he had the idea that the Egyptian temples and the libraries, which were destroyed in Egypt, were now really a reincarnation in the tarot cards. And here were the 78 pages from those libraries that you could see if you looked at every one of the tarot cards. Gébelin began working on the cards, deciphering their meaning, and claiming in his book that the cards came from a lost Egyptian magical handbook, the Book of Toth. The Egyptian connection was a potent one. There is even a Book of Toth deck, but Gébelin's conclusions may have been hasty. Many of the tarot readers talk about the Book of Toth, this um, supposedly mystical book that, that has a lot of power in it and, and gives you information about things that you're not supposed to know. There are books that had occult powers, that had magical powers for the Egyptians. But a specific book of Toth, we don't have. Whether Gébelin was right or wrong, his book was extremely influential. Within two years of the publication of Côte de Gébelin's theories, a man called Aliette, who reversed his name uh, to Eteia and had, had various occupations, but in the past he had been a professional fortune teller, and he became one again, only this time using the tarot pack. Eteya became the first of the successful society tarot readers, and set about giving the cards new meanings and devising new spreads. The spread he is best known for is The Great Figure of Destiny. One of the largest spreads ever devised, it is still in use. The spread involves shuffling and laying out all 78 cards of the deck. As with every spread, position determines the relevance of the cards. Cards on the right-hand side of the spread refer to the Quedant's past. The Lubber's card is the sixth of the Fool's symbolic journey through the Major Arcana. It's about decisions. The Fool learns that he must choose between the golden-haired woman who represents the sensible choice, and a dark-haired woman who represents the sensual. The fool must either follow his head or his heart. When the lover's card appears in a reading, it's a warning to make choices wisely, because there are far-reaching consequences. Years ago, this girl came to me for a reading, and she had two men in her life. And during the course of the reading, I described these two men to her. But I said, you know this Aquarian stockbroker that you're seeing? He's married. Did you know that? She said, he, I thought he was divorced. And I said, no, he's separated, but he's married. He hasn't started a divorce proceeding, and he's not about to start a divorce proceeding. He also has two children. Did he tell you that? She said, no, he didn't tell me that. And I said, and he has no intentions of getting married or settling down. And he's actually been clipped so that he can't have any more children. And this girl was like around 30, and he was in his 40s. And I said, so if you want to get married and have a family, which your cards indicate to me is what you're looking for, this other man is a far better choice because you can have children with him. Here, in the great figure of destiny, the lover's card refers to decisions in the past. The querent's present life is shown in the uppermost cards in the spread. The chariot card is the one the fool meets at the seventh stage of his journey. It's one of the most turbulent cards of the tarot, with two beasts pulling in different directions. The fool feels the inner turmoil of opposing desires, he cannot progress until his own conflicts are resolved. Readers are never surprised to find the chariot in a spread, since it indicates the kind of tensions that would typically prompt the querent to seek a reading. On the left of the figure of destiny lie the cards which point to the future. Justice is the eighth card of the fool's journey. It suggests solutions for his dilemmas. He learns the value of wisdom, reason, and considered argument. 
When justice appears in a spread, it can indicate legal solutions, which may not be as straightforward as they seem. But there's one guy I did a reading for. Um, he was going through a really messy divorce, really messy, and I just kept feeling, um, I couldn't quite work out why, but I kept saying, you've got to really keep your present relationship under wraps. You know, don't let your wife know. She'll use that as ammunition. And it felt, I don't know why, I kept feeling like telling him, just be really, really careful. And he was really being very evasive, and I thought, he's not going to tell me anything, but it, he just needs to be warned. And I felt like I was going on automatic. I couldn't, and my mouth kept saying, just be careful, be careful. And, um... When he came to the end of the reading, he said, um, oh, could I just ask a question about the new relationship? And um, I thought, fine. He took three cards, and I thought, oh, that's why. It was the Emperor card there with, with um, the Ace of Cups. Like, he was basically having an affair with his male boss, and at the moment he was going through a divorce. And I just thought, well, if his present wife got to know that he'd actually run off with another guy, she'd take him to the cleaners. As Etea was refining the great figure of destiny, the popularity of the tarot was growing. The renowned tarot reader, Mademoiselle Lenormand, was building up her Parisian clientele and had even made friends at the palace. She had read for Empress Josephine and had even predicted her marriage to Napoleon. Josephine was so impressed that she decided to learn the secrets of the tarot. But rather than read the cards for others, Josephine wished only to read the cards for herself. Although experienced tarot readers do read their own cards, they generally advise against it for beginners. Sometimes the cards can look alarming, and it takes experience to make a considered analysis. For those who know the tarot well, the peace and quiet of a solitary reading has its appeal. When the fool meets the hermit, the eternal seeker after truth, he learns the value of solitary reflection. His appearance in a spread suggests that the querent needs to take time to stop and think. Tarot readers find that there are times when they too must pause and consider, when they see bad news in the cards. Well, someone once came to see me, and it was the only time where I'd say I saw death in the cards. The first card was a, was a reversed um, tower card, which is chaos from chaos. It's worse. It's like never-ending. It's unresolvable chaos. And then the, the Ten of Swords, which obviously implied some sort of feeling from, from him that something had struck him from nowhere that he had no control over. And I thought, well, I looked at him and thought, well, he doesn't look well, but does he know that? I thought, well, I'll get some backup. I, I put more cards down, but it was even more awful. <laughs> As I was sort of going into that, I mean, he, he started saying, oh, I'm very, very ill at the moment, you know, I, I have AIDS. And it was almost like, ah, well, at least we can start the reading now. Fortunately, readings are usually less traumatic. For most people, it is a mixture of good and bad news, as the fool discovers at the next stage of his journey when he meets the Wheel of Fortune. He learns that everyone encounters changes in circumstances. It's no good blaming misfortune on fate. It's more important to make the best of what can't be changed. The wheel means movement. For the fool's tarot journey from birth to enlightenment, it's the halfway mark. Now he faces his greatest challenge. The next cards take him into the underworld where he will meet the darkest and the most sinister cards of the tarot. Towards the end of the 19th century, there was a revival of mysticism among the intellectuals of Europe. Magic, alchemy, Eastern religion, the Kabbalah, the ancient tomes were all dusted off. In London, leading figures such as the poet W.B. Yeats were attracted to secret societies such as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, founded by the occultist MacGregor Mathers. Members embraced the rituals of high magic. Yeats wrote, Mysticism is all that I do, all that I think, all that I write. The new mystics were enchanted. But as the fool soon realizes, Enchantment can be dangerous. The Enchantress, whom the fool meets next on his journey, represents a powerful force. Indeed, the card is often known as strength. Her personal charm is considerable, and the fool learns that self-discipline is vital. In a tarot reading, the card sounds a warning, a call to self-control and restraint, 
qualities which later proved to be lacking in some members of the Golden Dawn movement. As they continued their studies, the Golden Dawn scholars realized that the most potent symbols of the ancient mystical systems had been unified in the tarot. There were parallels between the tarot journey, the tree of life of the Kabbalah, and the alchemical path to the Philosopher's Stone. They set out to refine and explain the tarot, and to bring together all their ideas in a new and even more powerful deck. We know about the order today thanks to Pamela Coleman Smith. She was an artist that worked with Arthur Edward Waite to produce what was called the rectified tarot deck. She was known as Pixie to her friends. Around 1903, she joined the secret order of the Golden Dawn, and she began to paint visions that came to her while listening to music, music by Beethoven, Bach, Chopin, Debussy. In 1909, she undertook for a very small payment to do a series of 78 cards known as the Rider Waite Tarot Deck. It was a big job, but very little pay. Were it not for this particular deck, Pamela would not be known today. Instead, there are millions of her decks sold, and she's become very well known. What Pamela did was she actually had a picture on every pip card. For example, the Ten of Swords has a man lying flat with ten swords uh, into his body, showing how a disaster is going to occur. That's a much easier card to read than to just see ten cross swords as it was done in the Taramasse deck. But even as the famous deck was being created, the idealism which marked the birth of the Golden Dawn was fading. By 1905, the founders had deep differences about the interpretation of mysticism. The twelfth card on the fool's journey, the hanged man, is about just this sort of disillusionment. It teaches the fool to question values and search for new solutions when things no longer make sense. When the hanged man appears in a reading, it suggests that sacrifices may be needed and that the querent must try looking at the world from a new angle. There was new thinking at the Order of the Golden Dawn, but it proved misguided. The intellectual curiosity of the early days turned into an obsession with the occult. The fool, too, is going through the darkest part of his journey to enlightenment. He meets the 13th card in the Major Arcana, death. This skeletal image strikes horror, but in the tarot journey, death doesn't mean the end, only change. The fool learns not to be frightened by change, but to embrace the challenge of a new order. Querents fear seeing the death card in their spread but it seldom means physical death. It usually signals a new direction, a new job, or partnership. With death behind him, the fool encounters the 14th card, temperance, representing the balance of heart and mind, which he needs to thread his way through the temptations of the underworld. Reversed, the temperance card takes on a special meaning for business. It suggests conflicts of interest. Lily Gaines, was once consulted by a businessman who was being swindled by his partner. Yeah, I've actually had a guy who came in and I did readings for him and it's quite clear that his business partnership was really needed to be dissolved. It seemed like the guy was the, the accountant, uh, the king of, uh, king of Pentacles reversed a lot. The guy was basically swallowing up the money. And um, really it just felt that independence, he kept coming through as the magician, he needed to be as independent as possible in his business. And I was trying to do cards on it, and I kept thinking, he's got some funny ideas. I said, there is an orthodox way you can do this, you know. You don't have to sort of be dirty or do fiddles or anything. He said, you can just get rid of this guy. And then at that point, he took the tape off and said, that's why I'm here. I need to know how far can I get away with being really evil. Basically, he was planning to bump the guy off. And he wanted to know if he'd get away with murdering him. The darker side of human nature emerged in the history of the tarot with a member of the Golden Dawn, Alistair Crowley, creator of the Book of Toth tarot deck. The deck 
reflected his interests in dark forces and his preoccupation with the devil. The devil card is a new challenge in the fool's metaphorical journey. It represents enslavement to evil. The fool comes to realize that we all have a darker side which we must overcome. When the devil card appears in a reading, it indicates danger and threat. Years ago, I read for a playboy bunny who uh, happened to be a friend of actress Sharon Tate. And a month before the Tate murders, I read for her and she got the devil and the tower and the nine of swords and the ten of swords. And I began to tune into them and I said, there's going to be a murder and it's going to involve more than one person. And there is something satanic about it. And there's drugs, and there's alcohol, there's guns and knives. And, it's, and I started feeling sick to my stomach. And I said, I can't talk about this anymore because it's making me ill. There is one further test for the fool if he is to reach fulfillment. The next card he meets is the Tower of Destruction. It represents the shattering of old illusions, a period of momentous change. The fool is forced to seek new philosophies upon which to rebuild. In readings, the tower can point to disaster, distress and financial ruin. Strengthened by his trials, the fool emerges from the dark part of his journey. At last, he sees a glimmer of hope with the next card in the major arcana, the star. In a reading, the appearance of the star card suggests altered prospects, new opportunities, a new start. For the tarot too, a fresh start is on the way. For the first time in its history, the tarot reached across the Atlantic. In the 60s, the life-enhancing aspects of Eastern mysticism rose to popularity on a wave of peace and love. The spirit of the age brought with it a renewed interest in lost and forgotten arts, including the tarot. Stuart Kaplan was on a trip to Europe when he first came across the tarot pack. I went there and found a tarot deck. I had no idea what it was. It seemed interesting. I brought it back. I went to a store in New York City, they bought 100 copies, and in the first year I sold 200,000 copies of the 1JJ Tarot deck. Since then, Kaplan has sold millions of cards. He has commissioned dozens of new decks, each one retaining the powerful symbolism of the traditional cards. One of the most familiar of all the ancient images in the tarot is the moon, the next card of the fool's journey. The moon is the card of intuition. Contemplating it, the fool discovers the sensitive side of his nature. In a reading, the moon card represents dreams and inspiration. Many tarot readers recommend quiet contemplation of the cards. I think the positive value of tarot cards lies in in how you can help yourself to understand yourself by looking at those pictures. I mean, the, the really um, striking cards, some of the major arcana, really can be looked into for a long, long time. I mean, you, can, you can use them to meditate. Meditators often choose positive cards, and one of the most uplifting is the sun. When the fool meets this, the brightest card in his journey, he gains optimism and joy. In a reading, the card is equally positive, suggesting contentment, a happy marriage, and a successful outcome for plans and business ventures. The positive emphasis which the 60s brought to mysticism has given a new slant to the tarot. Now tarot readers regard the cards as a healing resource, an aid in counseling and therapy. They see the readings as offering help. The reason people come back once they've had a reading from me is they've found that the readings are healing. They're not just telling them what's happening in their life, what's likely to happen in the future, but they're empowering them, they're healing them, they're helping them understand why it's happening, what things they need to let go of, what things they need to embrace to be able to go on with their lives. 
The fool is nearing the end of his journey through the major arcana. As he approaches his goal, he encounters the Judgment card. It's a day of reckoning, but it offers a chance of redemption. In a reading, the Judgment card indicates an opportunity for assessment or a time of testing. The Tarot has had its share of testing, too. Parapsychologist Sue Blackmore, fascinated by the accuracy of her tarot readings, decided to see if there really was magic in the cards. I had ten people and an assistant. I asked the assistant to get each of the ten people to sit down with her and shuffle the cards and lay them out in exactly the way I would normally do. She would then just take the cards from them, write down the top ten cards and make a list of all those card orders and give it to me, coded so I didn't know which was which. I then sat down, imagined the person was in front of me, went through all the shuffling and laying out again, but laid out the ones she told me and did a reading on that basis and I wrote down all the ten readings and then gave all the ten readings written down back to the ten people and asked them if they could pick their own. Well, if tarot works in the way that it's usually claimed, that is it really does relate to the person who's shuffled the cards, then they ought to be able to have picked their own much more often than you'd expect by chance. And they couldn't. But Sue Blackmore's tests were not conducted in the same way as a normal tarot reading. The big difference is I was not sitting there looking at the person. And that, to my mind, is what you need. You need to be there with the person, getting the feedback, having all the psychological communication. What's really going on in a tarot reading is not directly to do with the, with the cards. The cards are more facilitators, if you like. What's really going on is between the people. It's psychology, it's not magic. Many people believe that a successful tarot reading is dependent simply on the reader's psychological skill. What it may be is simply as a psychological crutch for the reader. That is, the cards don't have the magic. It's, in a sense, the reader that has the magic. He's got all kinds of information in his brain. He sees people. He can size them up. He can tell what kind of person they are. He can tell if he's nervous, if he's this. He can tell if he might be successful, if he's a winner or a loser. But most tarot readers would disagree with this view. Their experience tells them that it's the cards that determine the reading. When I first started doing readings, it was the one thing that used to freak me out. I knew when I did my own cards, the cards were very relevant. And when I did people that I knew, but then when you do people you know, you think, well, is it just because I know them that I'm making that sense? I know the situation in their life. But when you've done hundreds of total strangers and you're just going by the cards and it's always particularly relevant to them, I don't know. There's a consensus that even given the accuracy of the cards, the sensitivity of the reader is crucial. It's like a mirror reflection of what you're thinking, what you would like to think, or what vibrations you're picking up. And the cards allow you the catalyst to relate that in a verbal story. It's a visual image that you can verbalize. At last, the fool has reached the end of his travels. He meets the world card, symbolizing completion, self-fulfillment, and true enlightenment. The fool has reached his goal. He's learned from all the stages of his journey and passed every test. In a reading, the world is a wholly positive card, suggesting happiness and resolution. It symbolizes full knowledge and, finally, comprehension. Complete understanding of how the tarot works still eludes both querents and readers. They are no closer to explaining the power of tarot readings than they were 200 years ago. They work. I've seen them work. I don't know why they work. What probably appeals to me most is that they're as mysterious as the cause themselves. Why it happens, why I can do a reading, why the readings make sense. I don't understand it. Most people don't understand it. But the people who do it find that it works. It's enough intuitive nature in the cards and the allegorical imagery that can combine to form a story. We're still at a loss to explain the peculiar magic of the tarot. It remains a mysterious tool which somehow unlocks thoughts and emotions and foreshadows the future. But for those who use the tarot and live with it, there's no denying it. It's all in the cards.